The Quarterly, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Lesson 7, 1st Corinthians 13, The greatest of these is love. 1st Corinthians 13 is the most famous chapter in 1st Corinthians, and perhaps in all of Paul's writings. It's often taken out of its original context and used as a standalone treatise on the subject of love, at weddings and similar occasions. As a result, many assume that it speaks primarily about the relationship of a man and a woman. In its original context is important, as part of the wider letter to Corinth, and more narrowly at the centre of Paul's discussions of spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 12-14. through 14. To a church that was obsessed with spiritual gifts, to the point where there were major divisions in the body over them, see 1 Corinthians 12, Paul wanted to stress the primacy of love love for God, and love for one another within the church. Paul is not affirming the beauty of anything and everything that we may choose to call love, or extolling the virtue of warm fuzzy feelings over clear thinking. See 2 Corinthians 10.5. Rather, he was reminding the fractious, self-important disciples in Corinth of the importance of mutual dependence and care within the body of Christ as a reflection of the love that we ourselves have received from our Saviour. Even though God and Christ are not mentioned in 1 Corinthians 13, the sacrificial gift of the Son by the Father to redeem us from our sins is the foundation upon which our love for one another and for God rests. See 2 Corinthians 5, 14, 13, 11. In 1 Corinthians 12, 22-29, Paul described various spiritual gifts that have been given by God for the sake of the church, apostles, prophets, teachers, and so on. It is clear that some among the Corinthians, who considered that they had these gifts, thought themselves more important than others, and therefore not needing their help. They thought of themselves as the eyes and the ears of the body. But Paul argued that eyes and ears not only need each other, but even the seemingly less important parts of the body, if the body is going to function effectively. Perhaps that's why he included the unspectacular gifts of helping and administration in 1228, right alongside prophecy and miracle working. And Paul argued that there's something more important and more excellent even than spiritual gifts, namely love, 1 Corinthians 12.31. The gift of speaking in tongues, whether those tongues are other human languages or an angelic prayer language, is simply a strident, unmelodic noise, like a gong or a cymbal, if it is not exercised in love. 1 Corinthians 13, 1. Indeed, Paul will later argue that speaking in tongues in public without somebody interpreting for the whole community is not edifying, and therefore not a loving exercise of that gift. See chapter 14, verses 6 to 17. Likewise, the gifts of prophetic speech, understanding mysteries and knowledge, the faith to move mountains, all these are nothing without love. Verse 2. Prophetic speech does not necessarily mean the divinely inspired ability to predict the future, although it can. As we've seen, the word prophecy has a broader use in both Old and New Testaments. For example, 1, Corinthians, uh, 1 Chronicles 25 verses 1 to 3. Mysteries are not occult secrets, but things whose significance had been hidden in the past, but had now been revealed by God. For example, Ephesians 1 verses 9 and 10. Both of these word gifts that involved standing up and publicly teaching the congregation, 1 Corinthians 14, were absolutely nothing, of no use to the speaker or the hearers, if they were not delivered from an attitude of love. The faith required to move mountains is a proverbial description of great faith. Matthew 17, 19 to 20, or 21, 12. While a person giving away all their possessions or submitting their body to the persecutor's fire are the ultimate self-sacrificial acts, yet these two are nothing if they are done without love. Verse 3. Love is of paramount importance if our words and actions are to bless the body, 
of which each of us is merely a small part. Having compared the excelling greatness of love with various striking spiritual gifts, Paul goes on to fill in the qualities in which love consists. Both positively, love is, and negatively, love is not. Love is not merely a warm feeling, but a set of attitudes and actions that flow from a fundamental commitment to be for other people. Even though God is not directly mentioned in this chapter, he powerfully embodies each of these virtues, which is why the Bible can say, God is love. 1 John 4, 8 and 16. The Corinthians, on the other hand, have been exhibiting the exact opposite set of behaviours in their interactions with one another. Paul begins with a positive. Love is patient and kind, verse 4. See Exodus 34, 6, for these qualities as essential characteristics of God. Being for others means giving them room to make mistakes and to grow, rather than judging them swiftly and harshly. Paul then moves on to the negative, the description of what love is not. Love does not put itself first and others last. It's considerate and thoughtful of the needs of others, not demanding or easily angered, verse 5. It does not delight in wrongdoing, but, returning to the positive, love celebrates the truth, verse 6. Love also has an enduring quality that stretches beyond the grave. See the Song of Songs, chapter 8, verse 6. It always perseveres through trials with faith and hope, trusting that God's good purposes will inevitably win out in the end. Verse 7. As the Song of Songs puts it, many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. Song of Songs, chapter 8, verse 7. Paul returns to where he began the chapter, comparing and contrasting spiritual gifts with love. Prophecy, tongues, and knowledge, three of the gifts he mentioned at the beginning of the chapter as insufficient without love, in verses 1 and 2, are all temporary, whereas love never ends, verse 8. These spiritual gifts are temporary because our present knowledge is always partial and fragmentary. The gifts are useful because they increase our temporary partial knowledge by unfolding a little bit more of God's eternal purposes. But when the perfect comes, the partial becomes unnecessary and so passes away, verse 10. In other words, when we all know everything that we may know about God's purposes, we no longer need some people who have special gifts of insight into God's purposes, because we will all possess the same fullness of knowledge. Tongues, prophecy, and knowledge are all invaluable signposts along the way to God's eternal purposes. But when we reach our destination, such signposts posts will no longer be necessary. And this thought is in line with Old Testament expectations of a time when no one will need to be taught any longer, because everyone will have a full knowledge of the Lord. Jeremiah 31, 34. Isaiah 54, 13. This day of perfect knowledge is the day of Christ's return, when our present partial knowledge will be replaced by a fuller understanding. At Christ's return, we will no longer need preachers or prophets, because we will all have a far greater knowledge of God, seeing him face to face. Verse 12. Even in our glorified state, however, love will still be part of our experience. Verse 8. Now to be sure, the exercise of our love will change in significant ways. We will no longer have to be patient and kind with difficult people, nor will we struggle to avoid boasting and self-promotion. On that day, love will no longer have to bear all things and endure all things. Those attributes will no longer be necessary. Nevertheless, on that day, we will finally love truly, even as we have been loved. 1 John 4, 19 And in the meantime, as we await the return of Christ, our calling is to grow up into maturity. Children are by nature childish. They're often obsessed with things that lack lasting meaning and significance, 
and are easily distracted from what's most important. Little children sometimes spend more time playing with the shiny wrapping paper than they do with the gift itself. And the Corinthians were like children, in their obsession with the more glamorous spiritual gifts, while they neglected that which was most substantive, loving God and loving their neighbor. In the process, they focused on what was temporary and passing away, while neglecting what was eternal and enduring. Our knowledge now, through God's good gifts of prophecy, tongues, and knowledge, is like looking at yourself on a dim reflecting surface. Ancient mirrors were nothing like their modern equivalents. You could see an image in them, but it was nothing like seeing someone face to face. On the last day, however, our knowledge will be as clear and as crisp as our present vision of those who are standing right in front of us. We will know as we are known by God. And even then, we will still be rooted and grounded in love. The other cardinal virtues of faith and hope also endure into eternity, verse 13. But the greatest of them all is love. Application questions. 1. Does your church prioritize love? How, how would you know? 2. Which aspects of loving your family, friends, and church do you find hard? Which aspects of love do you find easier? 3. How does Jesus exemplify and embody love? 4. Why is love more enduring and greater than other virtues, even faith and hope? 